As you guys know, today is Reformation Sunday, celebrating the Protestant Reformation. It was 500 years since that initial spark of the Reformation back in uh, 1517, several years ago. And uh, now on the backside of that 500 year anniversary, it's uh, so encouraging to me to see how the truth of the Word of God is still continuing on today, even here in our country, to be spread. The truth of the Gospel is constantly being renewed to new generations, and we just thank the Lord for His sovereignty and work in that. Uh, the, the topic that we're going to look at this morning is going to be the sufficiency of Scripture and evangelism. The sufficiency of Scripture and evangelism. And you guys feel free to interact. I may ask some of you to read some passages and answer some questions, and uh, this, this can be an interactive time. We can kind of discuss this. So welcome anything that you have to say, any questions that you might may have also. But uh, we're going to look primarily at Psalm 19. So turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 19. We'll look at that passage first. And the reason why... I wanted to discuss the sufficiency of Scripture is as many of you may know, that spark that initiated the Protestant Reformation, it was really a drive to return to the text, a drive to return to the original manuscripts and to the truth that was presented within the pages of Scripture. And what had been happening was the Roman Catholic Church through the generations had essentially separated the people from God's holy word. They had separated the church from the scriptures. You see, it was illegal to have a portion of the scripture or the, the Bible in any other language other than Latin. The Latin Vulgate was the authorized version of the scriptures, and no one could have anything else other than that. In fact, people were persecuted for having even pages of scripture in their own language. And what the church fathers, the church leaders had deemed was that the common man was not capable of understanding the truths of God's Word. And so they needed intercessors, they needed intermediaries, men who were trained who could then stand between them and God and then communicate to them the truths of the Scripture so they could understand it. Now, obviously we know that this was, in fact, a ploy of Satan. This was something that Satan had been working behind the scenes within the church, introducing false teaching about God's Word into the Roman Catholic Church so that he could effectively separate the people who needed salvation from the source of salvation. Because the source of salvation is found in the Word of God. And so when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to that door in 1517, October 31st, he was doing more than just pushing back against the Roman Catholic Church's practice of indulgences. It was a spark of a revolution that would return the Church of God to the source of salvation. And so as we think about this practi practically, the sufficiency of Scripture as it relates to our evangelism, how we take the gospel to people today, that's, that's the position that we're going to look at it from. So look first at Psalm 19, and I'll read verses 1 through 6. First he says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The truth of creation, the general revelation of God being presented to man ever since time began, since the first creation giving glory to God himself that's what this creation does it brings all men into an understanding that there is in fact a God that there is a creator this creator is Lord of all he has created all things and we are to praise him and give glory to him 
So in this passage, you see two different things being presented here. There's this concept of general revelation, which is the creation given to us for God's glory. And then there's also special revelation. That is special information that has been handed down directly by God to us as people. We see that in verses 7 through 11. So let's read those passages now. It says, The Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And so we see two things going on here. We see first God creating the earth. God creating all the things that are physically apparent to us. These are things that we can see, taste, and touch. These are things that have been apparent to all men for all time. And these things bring glory to God. These things tell us that there is a creator. And so we must worship this creator. That's what general revelation does. But I want to point out something. If you notice, general revelation in verses 1 through 6 doesn't say anything about transformation within a person. And so while general revelation, the physical world around us, it does bring glory to God and it should cause us to worship God, it doesn't actually save from our sins. You see, we see that in special revelation, and that is the Word of God. And God has chosen different ways to give us special revelation through history, through human history. First, there was the prophetic utterance, God speaking directly to people through men. And then there was the written scriptures. And so today we have the testimony of this prophetic utterance written down for us in the pages of God's word. And this prophetic utterance of God's word, it has been completed. It is finished. And this is the truth that's been given to us. And so it is this truth, this special revelation, this information that's given to us specifically through the prophetic word that brings about salvation in the hearts of men. So you have general revelation that glorifies God, and then you have special revelation that brings about salvation. Let's turn to a couple of passages real quick. Turn over with me to 2 Peter. Let's look first at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Anybody want to read that for us? Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So prophecy never came about through a man's own will. It never came about through the inner workings of man. It is not something that we came up with within ourselves. Prophetic utterance is special revelation given to men directly by God through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has given men information and then men have then transcribed the truth of this information. This is where we get our doctrine of inerrancy. The belief that God's Word is perfect. It's perfect and it's true. There is no error in God's Word. Now, obviously that's in accordance to the original manuscripts, the original Greek, the original Hebrew, and what we have in front of us today in the English version, that's, that's a translation of this truth. But it doesn't change the fact that God's Word is perfect as it has been presented. It is inerrant. And so if we understand that God's Word is inerrant, then we also must then deem that God's Word is sufficient. If God's Word is perfect in everything that it talks about, 
then God's word is also sufficient to give us everything that we need for all the things that it addresses. Now look back at verse 3. He says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And so what is it that this divine truth applies to? What does he say there? Two words. Everything, right? Everything pertaining to to life and godliness. So do we need anything outside of special revelation to direct us in life and godliness? Lots of folks on YouTube, though, that uh, don't understand verse 20 and 21, telling us all manner of nonsense and prophesying things that, you know, a lot of self-proclaimed prophets out there today mm -hmm. saying that, God told me this. God told me that. I don't, you know, like say this. We'll never learn this in a lifetime. You know, once you learn this, then maybe you can stand up and start. That'll never happen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. That's true. In fact, in in regard to that, turn over to Jude real quick. I like the book of Jude. Very interesting book. Jude 3. And, and it's interesting when, when you look at this in terms of chronology, Jude was probably the last book written prior to Revelation. So he says, verse 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation... I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. The faith that has been handed down to us, that is the gospel of salvation, special revelation about how men are to be saved. It has been once and for all handed down to men in the pages of the New Testament. And by this time, all of that was coming into completion. And he's saying, don't look for further revelation. Rather, guard the thing that has been handed down to you. The gospel of truth that has been presented to you. Guard it. Keep it away. Guard it from things that may enter into it to distort it. And so the truth has been given to us in the pages of the New Testament. And what that means is that anyone who comes later, and John will then establish this at the end of Revelation, anyone who comes later to add to the Scriptures is preaching something other than truth. And we're to guard this that's handed down to us from that. And so without getting into a, a deep conversation about spiritual gifts and the, the whether prophecy still still happens today, we know that this is true. We know that the gospel doesn't change. And we know that the gospel has been given to us in the pages of Scripture. And so according to, according to Peter in 2 Peter, if, every, if, if Scripture is everything that we need for life and godliness, then that raises some questions. Well, why would we go outside of Scripture to look for anything that pertains to religious observance? And even, let me add this, why would we go outside Scripture to try and convince anyone to be saved? That's a legitimate question. Anybody have a good answer for that? Is there a good reason to go outside of Scripture to convince someone to be saved? Um, no, in fact, it's... It's scripture to convince somebody that they're not saved or they're out of the bounds. You know, Deuteronomy 4 tells us, Moses said, don't you dare add to the word or take away from it. And then it also <coughs> said in Revelation, and Revelation expounds what the consequences, and I'm dealing with the Mormons, I've been trying to show them, you guys are Joseph come lately, or Johnny come lately, and a thousand of years of the word of God was established, Old Testament, and now you come and you have this guy that has private interpretations and revelations. So you guys have to 
Uh, I challenge them, you better search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. You better find out exactly who this Jesus is. You know what I'm saying? So it's within scripture. All things are right here from cover to cover. So it's, a, it's an evangelistic tool, I believe, to show them that scripture is inspired by God. So, Amen. And, and uh, let me just say something to that real quick. And if you think about what's going on there, this modern day uh, distortion of truth, it's exactly what was going on in the days of Martin Luther and John Calvin and, and Zwingli and, and the Reformers. It's exactly what was happening. The Roman Catholic Church, you see, they had established that while Scripture is authoritative, also the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church, especially the Pope, has authority here on earth. He is God's voice here on earth. And so the Pope is still receiving prophetic revelation from God, and he can speak authoritatively to theological things. And not only that, church tradition is also an authority. And so we can point back, they could point back to the canons, the, the Roman Catholic uh, canons that they had developed through different meetings and controversies, and they would say that these things are also an authority. So you've got scripture that's an authority, but it's, it's in Latin, and we're the only ones who can tell you what it means. But it's, it's got an authority in itself. Church tradition is an authority, and so we'll appeal to what the canons have established in church tradition, but then also the Pope is an authority and so you've got three things that are all claiming to be an authority and unfortunately what happened was these three things were in contradiction to one another and so then what becomes the absolute authority when the Pope contradicts scripture then who's right when the church church tradition when the canons contradict scripture then which one do we go with well because they had taken the scriptures out of the hands of the people they got to decide. They could say, well, you just don't understand what the scriptures are actually saying. Let me explain it to you. And so the Reformation was all about taking this truth, this sufficient truth, the only authority, that's the only authority that there is for all things that we need for life and godliness. It was about taking this and putting it back into the hands of the people in a language that they could understand. And that's why Bible translation was such a huge part of the, uh, the Reformation. We were, they were taking the, the, tr the original manuscripts, the Greek and the Hebrew, translating them into common languages, and then putting them back into the hands of the people. And that's where the reformation of the truth of the gospel came from. The common man had the word now in his language. He could understand it, and he eliminated the authorities, the church authorities, the supposed prophetic authorities, and he simply went back to the text and then salvation sprang forth through Europe and out to the rest of the world. That's why we are believers today, because of that. Sorry, go ahead. Well, amen to all that. I'm um, just going back to your original question. Um, when we're presenting the gospel, should we go outside of that? The only other application that's biblical is our personal, the indwelling Holy Spirit, how God has changed our own life and how this has impacted me, and we can give that witness mm -hmm. along with the proclamation of the word as it's proclaimed in Scripture. Absolutely, and and we're gonna we're gonna we'll circle back to that because that's actually a, a biblical concept as yeah. well. We're gonna circle back to it, and we'll we'll deal with our uh, our testimony of what the truth has done in our life and how that affects uh, the world because Scripture actually says it does have an effect. And so we're going to come back to that. It's a great point, though. Um, but one thing that, that I think we need to realize, is if we're going to declare that Scripture is both inerrant, it's both perfect and sufficient, it's perfect and it's sufficient to deal with all things that it claims to deal with, everything that we need for life and godliness, then what we have to do is we have to draw a really tight net around Scripture. And anything that we do in terms of salvation, anything that we do in terms of spirituality, anything that we do in terms of how we govern and manage the church and then do the mission of the church out in the world, it has to be grounded in Scripture and it has to flow forth from a proper interpretation of Scripture. And so to, to treat Scripture as though it is sufficient means that Scripture itself is what informs us of all things that we need. 
So returning to that, when it comes to the concept of salvation, there are those who are faithful, faithful brothers. Now, we're not talking about people who are, who are heretics. We're not talking about people who are completely unorthodox. We're talking about faithful men who would say, yeah, but we still have an intellect and we still can philosophize. We still can look at the facts that are in front of us and we can be convinced by certain things that are not necessarily in Scripture, but they appeal to philosophy and the physical world around us uh, to say that we can, we can bring people to salvation in these ways as well. But I, I want to look at a few other passages that I think would contradict that. Let's turn over to Hebrews 4. Now, understanding that Scripture is sufficient, it, it requires that we also understand the condition of man. What condition is, is man in? When we talk about being born into sin, when we talk about original sin and orthodox doctrine, when we talk about the fact that we are all sinners from birth, what we have to recognize is that because we are born into sin, we are incapable of coming to God of our own accord. So you remember back what Psalm 19 was saying in those first six verses. It was saying that the heavens declare the glory of God, but it didn't say anything about the heavens bringing men to salvation, right? Because the physical world around us doesn't bring anyone to salvation. In fact, what it does is it condemns man in his sin. The physical world serves, the evidence that's around us serves as a condemnation to man's rebellion against God. Salvation comes from special revelation. Look at verse 12 of Hebrews 4. He says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now let, let, me, let me ask you this. You, you may have a very wise person, a very intelligent person, a very learned person, a philosopher, but can any person, no matter how intelligent they are, discern the thoughts and intentions of a person's heart? Not the way Scripture can. We may be able to look at external behavior, but there's no way for any human being to actually go into the heart of a person and discern what's going on within, within them. And there's no way that any human argument outside of Scripture can penetrate the depraved heart of man, the sinful heart of man. Let's look over at Romans 1 real quick. I know we're going all over the place, I'm sorry. So returning to that concept of general revelation, the physical world, the evidence that's presented to us, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because of that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. And that's what Psalm 19 says, right? They are clearly presented to us, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. No one has an excuse to stand before God having not submitted to him as a Lord. No one has an excuse to stand before God and say, well, you just didn't give me all the information that I needed. He will say, no, you've been given sufficient information in the creation of the world. And so therefore you are required to submit to the Lord. So general revelation stands as a condemnation to all men. 
Yeah, we just drove 2,100 miles, I think, from North Carolina to, to St. George, Utah. Uh, three days, it's a great trip, wonderful trip. The kids did great. Uh, we've got a one-year-old and an eight-year-old, and uh, they were both phenomenal. Uh, just sing their praises for a minute. They did a wonderful job. But as we were driving, you know, coming across the plains, uh, it's beautiful out there. When you just look out, there's not a tree in sight. You can just see forever. You can see the horizon and the sunset. It's a beautiful place. Coming into the Rocky Mountains, I was just amazed by the grandeur of this creation and the power of it. And you just recognize how small we are as individual people. Coming across Utah and you just see all the amazing formations. All of this, the creation of God. And I was just astounded by all the things that I saw. And it brought me to a, a, an attitude of praise, an attitude of worship towards God. But you know, it's something I, I couldn't get out of my mind as I was driving across there and, and looking at all these beautiful and wonderful things that God has created. While it is a picture of creation, and while it does, as it says in His Word, bring glory to Him for His creative ability, it's also a picture of judgment. And we all recognize that, right? The surface of the earth, even, that we're looking at today, it is, a, it is a remade surface. It's a surface that was remade by water because it was judged by water. God, at one time, destroyed the entire surface of the earth as an act of judgment for man's wickedness. And now what we look out, although it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's majestic, it also should remind us that God is a perfect judge and he will judge unrighteousness. And at one time he did judge this entire earth through water. Um, that's just amazing. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to rewrite world history, right? I mean, our, our nation even, the official stance of our nation doesn't recognize a biblical worldview, doesn't recognize a biblical timeline. There are those who claim to be Christians who don't even recognize that there was a worldwide flood. And so the world is constantly trying to push this idea of God's judgment out of its mind, but you simply stand and you look and you see that God is a righteous judge and he has judged this earth, which means what his word says is true, that he will once again, one day judge this earth. And so according to God's general revelation, all men stand condemned, but there is hope in special revelation, the truth of God's word. And that's because we recognize the work of the Holy Spirit. So even though men can't be saved from simply looking out at general revelation, they can be saved according to the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm going to read this passage. You don't have to turn to it. It's back in the Old Testament. But this is a great passage. It's a New Covenant passage. It's Ezekiel 36, verses 36 and 37. This is truth that was prophesied for Israel, but... It, the spiritual aspect of this is also applicable to us as well. Verse 36, he says, I'm sorry, 26. 30, chapter 36, verse 26, he says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So who is it that does the internal work in a person? God does. It's not according to an argument. It's not according to a philosophy. It's not according to even evidence. It's a miraculous work. It's a miraculous work wrought by the Holy Spirit. It is a work of God. And so as we look back at the Reformation and the five solas of the Reformation, one of those key truths that Luther established for us through his own testimony was that salvation is by grace alone. It is by grace alone that we're saved, not grace alone plus something else, not faith plus something else. It is an entire, entirely of grace, 
because the work of salvation that happens inside a person, within the heart of a person, is entirely a work of God. It's not even that we made the right decision at some point in our life. It is that the Holy Spirit has changed us just as he will national Israel one day as he points out in this passage. Thankfully, we're recipients of that as well. If you look at Philippians, turn over to this one, Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. Somebody want to read that? Therefore, my beloved, as you have already obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Who is it that works within the person? God. God does. God saves. God brings about salvation in the hearts of men. God does this according to his perfect choice. He acts according to his divine election. God has purposed all of these things in eternity past, ultimately for his glory, and it is him who is going to bring all these things to pass. God saves according to his will. Romans 9, verses 14 through 16. He says, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills, or the man who runs. It doesn't depend on human action, but on God who has mercy. It depends totally upon God. And what is the means by which God has chosen to save men through the power of the Holy Spirit? It is special revelation, the Word of God. And we can see that too. Flip over to Romans 10. Look at verse 13. Now verse 13 is probably a, a verse that you guys have heard regularly and maybe, maybe you have this memorized. But this is a favorite verse of those who would uh, teach what we may call decisional regeneration or even an easy believism type of gospel. They would say, well, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So all you have to do is simply pray a prayer, ask the Lord to save you, and you're saved. Well, if you've prayed that prayer from a changed heart, that's true. But praying a prayer does absolutely nothing in terms of your salvation because you can't do anything to save yourself. In th verse 13, he begins by saying, For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, and that is true, if it's true salvation. But then in verse 14, he says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not believed? heard and how will they hear without a preacher and how will they preach unless they are sent just as is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things how are they to not all heed the good news for Isaiah says Lord who has believed our report so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ and what we see here is, is an unbroken chain of how a person comes to saving faith. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord certainly will be saved, but how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how do they believe? Well, it's by a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit takes the heart of stone, makes it a heart of flesh, and conforms it to him. So even our believing is an outflowing of the miraculous work of God. What is the means that he does that? How can they believe in whom they have not heard? So they can't believe 
or the Spirit will not work salvation in the heart of anyone who has not heard. Those who haven't heard the truth, the special revelation of God, the truth about their own sin, the truth about the work of Christ, the truth about the resurrection and eternity, the truth about repentance and submission to his lordship. If they haven't heard these truths preached from God's word, if someone hasn't actually told them these things, they will not be saved. And so we can see in this two sides of, of a coin, both God's divine action in salvation, a salvation that is totally of God, that is all of his mercy, but then also our responsibility to evangelize the lost. You see, because just as the scriptures are the tool that God has chosen to save men through, we are the means by which those scriptures go out into the world. And so no one will be saved unless we take the truth of this word out to the world. Now we will do that because God has purposed that we will. His church will take the truth of his word out to the world. Evangelists will go out. Preachers will go out. Church members will go out to their neighbors and their co-workers and they will take the truth of God's word to them because God has decided that we would. But for us individually, we have to take this responsibility on ourselves as well. We have to recognize God's sovereignty and his divine action and salvation, but also our personal responsibility to take this information to people that we care about so that they will be saved according to the will of God, according to the divine will of God. Matthew 28, 19, the passage that we're going to talk about today in, in the service that is our marching orders. That is our commission. It is a commission to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ, of lifelong followers of Him. Not simply professing converts. Not simply a tally of people who have prayed a prayer. But rather people who come into the church and who are committed to following Jesus Christ for the rest of their lives because they have been changed by Him. That's our calling and our commission. And so how does this affect our evangelism? Well, it means that we must go boldly, right? We go boldly proclaiming the truth, recognizing that it is God who does the work. And so we, we recognize our own insufficiency. We recognize our own weakness, our own inability. But if we're faithful to take this truth, God will save all those who he has set apart for salvation. He's guaranteed that. He's promised it. But likewise, it's not simply a mission of proclamation. It's not simply that we proclaim truth. You see, he also gives us a manner in which we're to live and proclaim. So let's look at some of these passages. Turn over to 2 Timothy 4. Second Timothy 4, Paul is talking to his young apprentice there, reminding him of the way that he's been taught. He says, preach the word, proclaim this truth, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, bring this truth to bear on people's lives. But this is how you're to do that, with great patience and instruction. So it's not in condemnation, it's not in pride, it's not in arrogance. It is with great patience and instruction that we are to take this truth to those who are lost, but also to teach these truths to those who are saved within the church. Turn over a page or two to Titus 3. Another one of Paul's young men that he trained up, teaching him here, how to be a pastor, how to raise up the church. And in this particular context, how to teach the church to interact with the world around them. He says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. This is why. 
For we ourselves also were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So how are we to take this truth out to the world? Well, we're to take this truth as those who have been changed by this truth, as those who recognize the miraculous work of God in our lives, as those who recognize that it is God who is at work first within us, and apart from that work, we would still be just like them. And so this is the manner that we're to take the truth out. How are we doing on time, brother? Got about three minutes. Three minutes, okay. All right, I'm going to give you one more really quickly. Turn over to 1 Peter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. And so this comes back to that testimony of what God has actually done in our lives. You see, if we recognize that salvation is according to the miraculous work of God, then by default we recognize that there will be a change in all those who have now been saved. We will be different. We won't look like the world. We'll be those who are following Christ, not perfectly, but we will be imitators of Christ. And is that imitation of the truth of God's Word impacting our own lives that in this passage indicates will bring others to salvation. And so they're not saved by our testimony in our life alone, but along with our verbal proclamation, the testimony of our good deeds, God will use to bring about salvation in the hearts of men. So the sufficiency of Scripture in our evangelism, it demands that we utilize Scripture alone for it, and it demands that we live in accordance with Scripture as a testimony of it. So, all right, we're done. Thank you. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you.